Um, so let's start with, there was a question by somebody yesterday about these projection <laughs> angles, right? So the, the H plus polarization had this one plus cosine squared of theta, and the H cross just said cosine theta, right? And the question was, what's going on? Why does this vanish at 90 degrees and this does not, right? So to remind you, we were looking at a system with two black holes in the xy plane, and the observer was at an angle theta here. So what happens, so the formula was correct. So what happens is if the observer was here, right, so that's, the, that's really the special case that you're looking at, uh, then this vanishes, and you're only left with, with this, right, only the h plus thing, and what that is, is a linearly polarized wave, right? So you're looking at the system from the side, so all that you're seeing is essentially a plane with two objects somehow moving on this plane, right? So that gives you a linearly polarized wave. On the other hand, uh, this guy, uh, what happens, so uh, yeah, and the other thing that, that happens um, is if you go put your observer up here, right, which is the other extreme, uh, then these two guys have the same amplitude, and what that is, it's a, it's a chiral wave, right? As you would expect by looking at the system right from the top and just seeing a circular motion, right? So the, the chiral wave is so h right and left, uh, just given by h plus plus minus i h cross, just the same as in, as you know from electromagnetism, and that's kind of the other extreme. So if you look at the power emission from a system like that, in an angular direction, yeah, so this is the z-axis, and the power emission, here's the xy plane, uh, looks something like this. So there is a minimum in this direction if you look at it from the side, but it doesn't go to zero. So that was the story we were missing yesterday. Does that answer whoever questions that was? Is the person there who had the question? Yes, you change place, that's not fair. How am I supposed to keep track? Okay, so today we talk about cosmology. So the first thing we need to do in cosmology is take into account the expanding universe. So we're going to consider the friedman robertson walker metric, where we take a scale factor which gives the overall scaling of the universe outside. Then we still have flat minkowski metric, uh, a small perturbation, and these guys are now the co-moving coordinates. Okay, so we just scale, take the scale factor on the outside, and then the magic, the magic of co-moving coordinates that essentially all your equations look nearly exactly the same way as they did before in the end, right? Just that you're working now in these coordinates uh, instead of in the coordinates that you would get directly from ds squared. So in particular, the gravitational wave equation for h mu nu bar in real space. So it would normally just have, we would just have the box operator, and on the right-hand side, uh, ah, okay, so now we're doing cosmology, so now there's no C's anymore, okay? So now C is 1. Um, <coughs> so here we have the source. And now there's one new term here, which comes precisely from the fact that this is time dependent, which is A prime over A, where prime and also the derivative with respect to uh, conformal time h bar prime mu nu for also of x and t. Okay, so it really looks exactly the same, just with one new term. Uh, if we go to Fourier space, we're going to switch to a variable which I call h twiddle. And h twiddle, where will it fit? Here. Um, h twiddle is nothing else than just a times h. Yeah, it turns out to be convenient 
uh, to put a scale factor in here just to make the equations more compact. Um, so second time derivative of this guy in Fourier space, tau is conformal time. From the box operator, from the spatial derivative, we get a k squared. Uh, we get this term here. H twiddle. And on the right hand side, ah, sorry, there's no A here. The A comes only in this line because we have multiplied with a factor of A. And this is now the the TB in uh, in Fourier space. And let me, instead of taking along the indices here, okay, here I've already done it, uh, I'm just going to, because in the end we don't need the 10 indices associated with this, right? We only need our two polarizations, the plus and the cross, so I'm denoting them by lambda. And this guy essentially also carries a lambda because in reality, if you remember, we have the projection operator, right? Which, if we're looking at a certain uh, helicity here, we just need to project and take the corresponding helicity over here. Okay, and then we exploit that Friedman equations tell us that A double prime over A is roughly given by A squared H squared. And now you see that in this bracket, uh, the new term is this one, right? This is due to the expansion of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's ignore that then. Um, this is the term due to the expansion of the universe. <laughs> Should we just make it stop? <laughs> okay, so this is the new term due to the expansion of the universe, right? And you see. Uh, what will be important if k is larger or smaller than a h, right? And what that means, so k now, k came out of the box operator. The box operator was in co-moving coordinates. So this k is actually the co-moving k, right? If you want to take, get the physical k, uh, you need to divide by a scale factor, which means that what this comparing k to a h just means comparing the wavelength of your gravitational wave to the Hubble horizon at that time. Okay, so we're talking about either superhorizon modes or subhorizon modes. So the first case is uh, k is much bigger than a h. Okay, so this is uh, subhorizon, very small scales. So then we can just forget about this term. Yeah, the equation looks just as before; it's a standard wave equation, but it's a standard wave equation for h twiddle. Right? So the solution for H uh, is just say let's take the, the, the cosine could also be some general exponential function divided by one power of the scale factor. Okay, so the amplitude of the gravitational wave due to the expansion of the universe decreases as 1 over A. And I mean, that's something that's no surprise because I mean, once we go to very small scales, we have to get something which immediately matches to, to what we get in Minkowski space, right? Because on very small scales, we don't feel the expansion of the universe. The opposite regime, so this is the super horizon regime. Now you can forget about the k squared term. We're going to write the differential equation back in the original coordinate h. Um, and you can see that this is 2a prime h prime lambda plus a h <coughs> lambda double prime equals 0. Uh, ah, so here I'm looking only at the, also here by the way, in both cases I was here looking only at the homogeneous equation, right? So I was looking at the, the propagation of vacuum, so it's just setting t mu nu in this equation to 0 in both these cases. Mm -hmm. and I just want to understand how the gravitational waves propagates in this background. So this differential equation has an analytical solution. 
with two integration constant, a and b. d tau prime a squared to tau prime. And the trick now is to notice that in an expanding universe, so in a matter-dominated universe or a radiation-dominated universe, uh, also a vacuum energy dominated universe, this term is always decaying, right? So it can play a role initially, but on the long term this will not play a role. Right? So to good approximation, this entire thing is just given by A, uh, which in particular was a constant. So what that means is that on superhorizon scales, your gravitational wave is a constant. So it's not actually a wave. I mean a wave, a wave looks like this, right? So what we say here is that on superhorizon scales, the gravitational wave freezes out. And that's in particular important in the context of inflation. Because in the context of inflation, you start with perturbations which are small, which are subhorizon. So they are decent waves. Uh, and then at some point, they get pushed outside the horizon. And then when they're outside the horizon, they do nothing. Right? They just sit there. They have this amplitude. They don't, they don't oscillate. Um, and they just sit there and do absolutely nothing. There's no dilution with the scale factor. Um, and they can stay there for, for millions of years, right? Or billions of years. And then once they re-enter into the horizon, uh, they start showing that behavior again. Right? So this is kind of how we can store information from the extremely early universe uh, outside the horizon without losing information to cosmic expansion. Um, yes? Yes. Um, in the literature, I'm used to see at mu nu plus the perturbation. Is that a convention thing, or am I missing uh, I think it's just because the index is downstairs here. Yeah. Uh, right. No, then it should be right because this is the so. Okay. No, you're right. So in the inverse metric, it should be minus. In the actual metric, it should be plus. Okay. Cool. Yes. You said the, the gravitational wave freezes out, right? Because that integral yeah. is, is, is not that big. But uh, is there some assumption about the scale factor? Well, only that we're in an expanding universe. So uh, matter domination, you can plug in explicitly matter domination, radiation domination, and vacuum energy, which is all that we think we ever had in the universe. And you, you always get this behavior. Uh, it's, but it's not in general true, right? I mean, if you had a contracting universe for some reason, like a bounce or something, then then I think this would not hold anymore. Yeah. You are assuming that the T mu is zero, but if it's like in the real universe, can you really assume that? Because no, I I can't. But I just want to show. I just want to show. Like essentially, we will have two two effects. Um, one is kind of the source, right, which kind of gives you. Um, sources your gravitational waves, but then at some point the gravitational waves just propagate. And here I just want to discuss what is the propagation in, in FRW. Actually, I think the, the next equation will make that a bit clearer. Um, so, with all of this in mind, uh, we can write the Fourier expansion of a gravitational wave in transverse traceless gauge in a, in a slightly a different way than we would normally write it. Okay, so we have a sum over the polarizations, plus and cross. Ah, okay, so I called it lambda here, so I will try and call it lambda consistently. Uh, integral dk to pi, integral over dk hat, so the angular integral. And now uh, the Fourier coefficients were essentially going to divide into two parts. of a lambda. So this entire thing is the Fourier coefficients. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, then we have the polarization tensor, which tells you if it's plus or cross polarization. Uh, and OK, the exponential function. And this guy here. Uh, so we, we did, if, if this were just one factor, this would just be standard Fourier expansion, right? What we've done here is we've separated this essentially into two factors. This part is the primordial part. So you have, uh, okay, there's no way you can read that from the back. It says primordial. Um, 
so you have whatever mechanism sources your gravitational wave, and you can essentially do a, a Fourier transformation right at the source, right? And you will get some sort of Fourier transformation which does not yet feel the expansion of the universe. And this would give you this coefficient here. And this thing is what we call a transfer function. And the transfer function accounts essentially for these propagation effects. Okay, so it accounts for how the rotation wave that is produced at the source in the early universe, how it is transferred to us today. And that is nothing else than the scale factor at a time, initial time, which depends on k. So this can either be the time of production, if it's produced on inside the horizon, or it could be the time of horizon entry, right, depending on on what type of resource you have, uh, divided by the scale factor today. So this is nothing else than this 1 over A factor here. So what that means is that if you measure a gravitational wave today, which you think might be of a cosmological or origin, you're always measuring a convolution uh, of the primordial source and the expansion of the universe. Right? And now you can say, OK, um, you, now you cannot proceed without making assumptions. Okay, so the standard assumption would be to say, okay, I think I know what the expansion history of the universe looks like, so then I can try and do something about the source. But in principle, you could also do it the other way around, right? Because maybe the expansion history of the universe is not the way we think it is. Maybe there's some surprises, and then you would try and say, okay, I think I understand what source this is. Uh, let's try and learn something about this transfer function. But you cannot. Uh, like, you, you cannot a priori disentangle this information for cosmological sources. Any questions on this so far? I must say you are surprisingly awake. Okay, so now the question I want to address is just it's going to be kind of a, an order of magnitude story. Uh, but we want to ask if I measure a gravitational wave of some certain frequency, and I, I convince myself, I don't know how, that it's not a, of an astrophysical source, I think this is a cosmological one, what time in the evolution of the universe did this gravitational wave correspond to? So, okay, so the first thing that we need to, of course, take into account is the redshift. So if we measure a gravitational wave today at some frequency, it means it was produced uh, at some frequency f star, which scales just as the scale factor uh, at that time divided by the scale factor today. Okay, that's just the usual redshift. And now we can say, okay, well this frequency at the time of production, uh, that corresponds to some wavelength at the time of production. Uh, and let's think about what can be a reasonable wavelength at the time of production. Well, if it's a cosmological source, essentially the only scale that you have at your disposal uh, is the Hubble scale. So that will be, if you know nothing else, that will be a reasonably good estimate of, of the wavelength that you're going to expect. If, you wanna, if you're a bit skeptical about that, we'll just, let's just put an epsilon star here, right? where uh, epsilon star characterizes, uh, simply parameterizes the size of your source with respect to the, to the horizon. And we'll just keep the epsilon star in the equation and at the end. If you just want to get a feeling for numbers, you set it to one, but it might not be exactly one. Okay, then the other thing we need is a Friedman equation in a radiation dominated regime because that's uh, where most of the evolution of our universe took place. So that's just H squared equal to the energy density in radiation. G star is the effective number of degrees of freedom. Uh, temperature, not to be confused with transfer function, 90 M Planck squared. OK, now you just plug this together, and you get that the frequency today corresponding to a temperature, normalize the temperature of the GV scale, 
for G star, we take the standard model value <coughs> in the high energy plasma. <coughs> then there's a one over epsilon from here. And so a gravitational wave produced uh, when the universe had a temperature of a GV, if epsilon star was one, uh, corresponds to 2.7 times 10 to the minus eight hertz. Now, LIGO, LIGO has a frequency of, well, roughly 100 hertz. Okay, so that's uh, uh, 10 orders of magnitude larger here. Uh, so that means it would correspond to a frequency of about 10 to the 10 uh, GeV. Okay, so what LIGO, the cosmological sources that LIGO was sensitive to, are really at an energy where like, there's absolutely no way we can build a collider to test that. So if LIGO sees something cosmological, it's really high energy. This is more the reference frequency of PTA, roughly. Okay, so PTA would tell you something about roughly the GV scale. And then Lisa lies somewhere in between. And of course, you can write this, I mean, just using standard cosmological evolution, uh, you can write this not only as a function uh, of the temperature, you can also write it as a function of the time. So if we're asking, uh, I have a frequency, I detect a gravitational wave at the frequency of one hertz. Okay, this factor stays the same. This stays the same. Um, so one hertz would correspond to the age of the universe of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 22 seconds. Okay, so that just gives you a feeling uh, how that we can really, what I wanted, the main point I want to make is that we can probe, uh, in principle, we can probe extremely high energies and extremely early times uh, with the frequencies that we have accessible in current experiments. Uh, the Friedman equation, right? So it's, it's, it's still here, right? Because I can compute A, like knowing how the universe expands, right? So essenti essentially, okay, so we have in principle, we have radiation domination, then matter domination, then lambda domination. Yeah, we can for sure forget about lambda domination because it doesn't actually do a lot on, on cosmological timescales. Uh, for most of these arguments, you can even forget about matter domination and just assume the universe was always radiation dominated. Uh, and then you can simply uh, write down how the scale factor expands as a function of time, right? So the scale factor then becomes uh, a function of temperature. Uh, I mean, because h, h, this is nothing than uh, a dot over a squared, right? Um, so you can, write it, you can write the scale factor either as a function of temperature, or you can write it as a function of time. Yeah, so to give you some numbers, um, yeah, so the, let's make a table. So we have a, f a frequency in hertz, the time T star in seconds, and the temperature T star in GeV. So PTA uh, corresponds, okay, roughly a frequency of 10 to minus eight. Uh, that will be 10 to minus 6 seconds after the Big Bang and a temperature of 0.1 GeV. What is that? Okay. So now we have some order 1 factors, right? So here it's 1 GeV, there it's 0.1 GeV. That's because I'm dropping all these order 1 factors. Um, okay, then Lisa, which will be the next one, I will tend to the minus 2 hertz corresponding 10 to minus 18. I'm just inserting in these formulas, okay? No magic. 10 to the 5 GeV. Um, and LIGO uh, would be 10 to the minus, sorry, 10 to the plus two here, 10 to the minus 26, 10 to the nine. So, yeah, what they say that in, in principle, you, there's a huge discovery space. And 
Lisa is a particularly interesting candidate, right? Because so these numbers are all for epsilon star equal one, right? Which really ma means you have a cosmological process which is off the side of the horizon. So with that assumption, uh, Lisa probes something of 10 to the 5 GV. Now, we t I briefly touched on the topic of phase transitions, first order phase transitions, right? So there, uh, the gravitational wave comes from, you have these first order phase transition, you have like bubbles of two vacuum which form in the old vacuum, and so the characteristic size would now be the size of the bubble, okay? And it turns out like t a typical number for the size of the bubble is about 10 to the minus three times the Hubble rate at the time. So if you insert that here, um, you see that Lisa is sensitive precisely to a temperature of the electroweak phase transition. Right, so this is why people say that Lisa is an excellent instrument to probe uh, if the electroweak phase transition was first order or not. Yeah, in the standard model, it's not first order, um, but people write down extensions uh, where it is first order, and then it would give you a signal uh, right here. Any more questions so far? Okay. All clear or all asleep? We'll see. Okay, so now, so now we, we've talked about roughly which frequency corresponds to which energy, but we haven't actually talked about what the signal looks like, right, and, and how we can actually uh, even look for it. So for that, we need to understand what is called the stochastic gravitational wave background. So because the, the, this, the type of signal that we get from a cosmological source is very different than the type of signal we get from an astrophysical source, right? An astrophysical source, like the black hole-black hole merger, you know, it has some very clear waveform, um, and the gravitational waves arrive at us at a certain point in time, and then they're gone, right? So it's a transient event, and we can very clearly say, uh, like, what amplitude corresponds to what time, right? So we, if you do a Fourier decomposition, it's a very, very clean and clear signal. Um, here, we're talking about something of a cosmological process, which means it happened at some time in the universe, but it probably happened everywhere, right? Because no reason why it would happen in one place and not at the other. So when the signal arrives at us, it means it arrives kind of from a, from a sphere around us, which corresponds to some cosmological distance, but it comes in all directions. And most likely, it's also not a monochromatic signal. Uh, it's very hard to get really a monochromatic signal in cosmology. So most likely, you'll have some range of frequencies, and you'll have these things coming from all directions, and now you're trying to measure this on Earth. Right? And that, that's a completely different problem than measuring a transient signal, which is very clear how to distinguish it from the background. And for example, your transient signal, when it's over, it's over, and then you can look at your noise and you can study your noise. The cosmological background, you can't turn it off. Right? It's always there. So there's, uh, it's much more challenging to distinguish the signal, what we call a signal, from the noise. And I think a useful analogy to understand that problem is the CMB. Because yeah, the CMB, and we're not talking about now the, the anisot anisotropies in the CMB, we're talking about the actual first measurement of the CMB. So just like this black body spectrum. And that is, in some sense, a very similar problem, right? Because there's just photons coming from all directions. Um, there's no way to turn it off. And I mean, as you, as you know, the way it was discovered uh, was by people trying to build uh, a very sensitive uh, radio telescope and not being able to reach the sensitivity that they were expected that they would reach, right? So they, they had some unidentified noise source. Uh, and that's essentially the same thing that we're looking for here, right? So we're looking, essentially the thing we're looking for here is we're looking for noise. Yeah? So we have it in our advantage that we kind of now understand the same B, so we kind of have a better idea of what type of noise we're looking for. We can look for it on purpose uh, and not just by accident. Um, but the problem is, is conceptually very similar. So, and then, I mean, the way, and okay, we have some generic expectations uh, for the properties. Yeah? So, generically, you will expect it to be isotropic, because uh, most things are isotropic in the universe. You would typically expect it to be Gaussian. Uh, this is in particular true uh, 
if you have a, a stochastic background uh, which maybe stems from many, many, many astrophysical sources which are distributed, distributed over the universe, then just have a central limit theorem uh, and you would expect it to be Gaussian. There are some exceptions to this, so you, there can be also non-Gaussian stochastic backgrounds. Um, yeah, but you don't really know, I mean, depending on the source, you, you can have, it can have a very, very broad peak in frequency or it can have a power law in frequency. Uh, we don't really know what we're looking for. So, let's start writing down some formalism. So we start with uh, the two-point function, right? Same as we would do. So a lot of this language is very similar to what we use for the C and B. So we look at the two-point function in Fourier space, uh, two polarizations, two different wave vectors. And this is just given by 2 pi to the 3 delta lambda lambda prime delta k minus k prime. And the really interesting part is this guy, which is the power spectrum, which in principle, um, yeah, no, okay, that's good enough for now. So this is, this is the power spectrum of the gravitational wave, right? And to make things a bit confusing, you will find in whatever literature you look at, um, you will probably find a different convention. Yeah, so either people will use, mean the same quantity but use a different letter, or they will mean a different quantity and use the same letter. Uh, you can put an arbitrary amount of 2s, pi's, and even k's uh, inside of this object and call it in a similar way. Um, so the way to, to resolve the confusion is always to go back to this formula uh, and see what is the normalization they impose on the two-point function in, in Fourier space. Um, and okay, I mean the differences come one from notation and differences come the way people define the Fourier transform, right? How many two pi's they put. Okay, so now um, we go back to we recall, so this is essentially, if you want, this is the primordial two-point function, right? So here, so far, there's no information uh, on the expansion of the universe. This is just like whatever source I had ha has this property. Now we recall uh, this story about the transfer function and the expansion history. Um, so with cosmic expansion, the two-point function in real space <coughs> essentially just given by this, the same expression because you just do a Fourier transform and then you contract on your um, Fourier coefficients but there's also the transfer function, so we get a factor a squared of tau star divided by a squared at whatever time tau you are doing this observation, yeah? so typically today. Um, so then recall that the contribution to T0,0, zero zero, yeah, the energy of the gravitational wave, um, that is given by the first derivative of this object. Um, so h dot a j h dot and essentially the only thing what happens here is you get a factor of 1 over a squared down from these time derivatives and the rest is all the same as up here So now we can write down the energy density in gravitational waves, so T0,0, zero zero, uh, which is just, I just give you the equation again because it's been two days, 32 pi g h dot uh, h dot, okay, in real space. Uh, and we can define essentially this to be 
integral d ln k d rho b ln k. Okay. So this is the object we can compute uh, directly from here. Okay. If we do the full ex expansion, it will be uh, some integral over k. And then we look at the integrand of this object, and we define uh, this object here to be essentially the energy density per frequency interval. Okay, this tells us how much energy is emitted in which frequency interval. And the quantity that people normally use, at least the one that which cosmologists use, is this capital omega, which is a function of the frequency and a function of the time, which is usually t0. Uh, and that is this object here, normalized to the critical energy density at whatever time you are evaluating this object. Okay, so this is a function of frequency. So this means this is uh, really a, a spectrum. Okay, so this, this tells you how much energy compared to the total energy budget that you have uh, do you have in gravitational waves at which frequency. And this is essentially the thing which is used, this is the thing that's computed in any given cosmological scenario and which you then really compare uh, to the sensitivity given by the, by the experiment. So now the question is how you actually measure this. Okay? And the way you measure this, um, you essentially now have to do a similar exercise like on the instrument side. Right? So on the instrument side, you have to think about, okay, you have an instrument, you have a certain light path, and you can compute uh, how a gravitational wave, first a single gravitational wave, and then I mean you just do the integral, uh, acts on this light path, acts on your photon, and how that results in a time delay of the photon that you detect, right? Which is your actual signal at the end of the day. Um, and I'll spare you the details and just give you the final results so that we have more time for inflation. Um, so in the end, the two-point function of the signal, which is a function of time, right? So this is really just the, the time delay in the interferometer that you measure. Uh, is given by L squared is the arm length of the detector. Then you have an integral over K. Yeah. You mean this, this derivative? Yeah. Uh, that's because we want to look at it at different frequencies. So if you would, if you would, so this is really the full energy, right? So normally, what I think normally what you would call omega, so if you think about omega dark matter, yeah. um, you would integrate this object over k. Then you would have the total energy in gravitational waves, right? And that's the thing you would normalize normally normalize to omega critical, right? But here you want to distinguish how much gravitational wave you have at which frequency. Right, so if you integrate this thing over k, you get the total energy in gravitational waves as a fraction of the total energy of the universe. Um, but here we want to keep this k-dependence because for our interferometers, it's very important. It's not so important how much total energy we have. It's more important what we have in the frequency band that we can actually see things. Um, OK, and here. Um, Here we have the power spectrum, right? So the, uh, okay, let me write for we have power spectrum and then we have what is called the instrument response. Squared because it was a two point function. Plus, plus the noise. Okay, so the, the idea is that, I mean, this is so similar to what we had before, right? Just now in a slightly different context. So the signal that you measure in the end, 
will depend essentially on two, two factors, right? I mean, in the end, okay, it's a bit messy to get to the formula, and this, this thing is a fairly messy expression, but it's only geometry, right? So this, this guy contains all the information on the detector, so it knows what is the arm length of the detector, uh, it knows what is the orientation of the detector, it knows what is the angle between the two arms of the interferometer. All these things are inside here, right? Uh, and this is your original source, uh, defined in this way, right? So what this thing tells you is that, okay, your signal in the end, well, no surprise, it depends on your source and it depends on your uh, instrument response, right? And this is also a, func a function really of the angle, so you, you are not sensitive, you're not equally sensitive uh, in all directions with your interferometer, but okay, you have a fairly broad uh, antenna pattern. And then if you actually want to compute um, the signal to noise ratio, right, so I'll just give you this expression because it can be useful in practice. So if you want to compute what is the signal to noise ratio of a particular model that you built, um, T, oh, we have too many T's. Okay, this is the T, the observation time, the observation time of your instrument. Then this is F min and F max is the frequency band that you are sensitive to. And inside the integral, you have your theory prediction of omega as a function of frequency. And then you have, from the experimentalist, they will tell you the sensitivity curve. Yeah, which is, can also be expressed in terms of omega. And the square root of that. Okay, so uh, it depends. Essentially, the, the question is simply, okay, is, like, does your theory prediction lie above or below the sensitivity curve? Um, then you, if it's something non-trivial, you really actually need to do this integral. And then you need to take into account that the probability of that detecting it grows as the square root of the observation time. And essentially, okay, so here we've, I mean, if I write it like this, this is kind of an autocorrelation of the signal of a single detector. Um, then I can improve a lot by looking at cross correlations. So if I have two LIGO detectors, I can cross correlate the signal uh, in both detectors and do the exact same exercise. And the key difference is the noise here, right? Because here I'm looking at uh, the autocorrelation function of the noise, uh, which is just the noise of the instrument. But if I'm looking at the cross-correlation of the noise, a lot of noise sources will disappear because they will not be cross-correlated across the two detectors. But with LISA, for example, I can't do that. Because yeah, LISA, I mean, LISA, there's no, all the interferometers share some arms in LISA, so there's no two completely independent detectors. So I can't say that the cross-correlation of the noise vanishes for LISA. Okay, any questions so far? So this was kind of stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds in general. If there's no more questions, I'll go to my favorite one. Yes? Just a question, is there some saturation for the observation time? Because now it just looks into signal to noise noise ratio just goes down for very long observation times. But I mean, the chance that I would break through and let it run for one million years, I mean, so some sort of saturation also? No, I think in principle, in principle you have, it goes the square root of t. I mean, the question is at some point, you know, you have, you have the, the cost in dollars versus the gain in, in physics, right? Because the square root is actually not, uh, not fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so can you discuss a little bit what the signal would look like? So it would be like, we would have a prediction for different frequencies and then the signal would be something else than we expect? Yes, yes. Um, okay, so I'll come talk about that a bit more detail in a second. Yeah. But let's do an example, right? I think that's useful. So um, let's look at phase transitions, mm -hmm. okay? Which I'm not an expert on, but I know the plot. So you have omega as a function of frequency, yeah? And a typical prediction for first-order phase transition, which of course depends on the model parameters, 
is that you would have like a fairly broad bump like this. Uh, let's say it's peaked around uh, 10 to the minus 3 hertz, so nicely at, at the LISA frequencies. So that would now be your theory prediction, yeah, depending, of course, on model parameters. And now you have the sensitivity curve from an instrument. So let's take LISA. Uh, the experimental calibration will provide you with the sensitivity curve. Well, or they may not, but you can digitalize their plots, and then they do. Um, and that will maybe look like this. This is a, the what the typical curve for LISA looks like. LIGO, LIGO will be sitting here. Uh, PTA will be sitting here. And now, essentially, what you're computing in this integral is, is more or less it's, the, it's this area here. right? And now you simply want to know, OK, this area here multiplied with the square root of five years, uh, what signal-to-noise ratio does that yield? And I think the rule of thumb is that if it gives you a signal-to-noise ratio bigger than 10 or 20, then you can detect it. Uh, if it gives you a signal-to-noise ratio which is smaller, then you cannot detect it. There's also an interesting, okay, an interesting side remark, uh, because it confused me for quite a while, um, is there are two different sensitivity curves, which are both given in terms of omega over f. Yeah? So one is really, the, this, this would essentially, the, the sort of sensitivity curve that enters here would be the sensitivity curve that they give, for example, in a paper for detecting binary black holes. Yeah? So it's really just the noise, the noise curve of the instrument, and you plug it in here, and you compute the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, there is something which is called a power law integrated sensitivity curve, where they have essentially decided that um, theorists are not capable of doing this formula, uh, which is often true. Uh, and hence, what you can do is you can say, OK, um, most signals are power laws in nature. So you can say, I, OK, I have my, my, my initial sensitivity curve, and now I ask, what is the power law such that, at such that the signal-to-noise ratio is 10. Okay, so you fix some given signal-to-noise ratio, then you look at all the power laws, which gives you S and R to 10. So that will look something like this, right? And then you can draw a curve here, which is tangent to all of these curves, like this. And this would be the power law integrated sensitivity curve, right? Where they've already, they've already so the reason they don't trust us using this formula is because we put the, do S and R equal 1, right? Um, and we are very optimistic about the observation time. Um, so they do that for us, and then they give this curve. And now you can really say, you have, if you have a signal which roughly looks like a power law, uh, if it's below this curve, you can't detect it. If it touches the curve, you can barely detect it. If it's above the curve, you can detect it. Right, so if your signal is roughly a power law, it doesn't be exactly a power law, but if it's roughly a power law in this frequency band, you can just use these curves uh, and just compare by I. Um, but if, if, your, if your signal does something like, I don't know, something wiggly like this, uh, then that's very much not a power law, and then you should not use, use these curves, then you should really do, do this integral. But, I mean, that was just an example, right? I mean, now, so that was the, the phase transition signal would be uh, not like this, would be like a bump like this. Um, what I want to show you next is what the signal from inflation uh, would look like. But then we also have, I mean, another signal which is very important um, and which is unavoidable is the signal, so for every black hole, black hole merger that LIGO observes, and there's going to be a ton of mergers which are just outside the volume of the detector, uh, so f further than, I don't know, 500 megaparsec away, uh, which means we can't see them. I mean, we can't see them at five sigma significance, okay? So we can't actually detect them. But they will still, of course, leak into the detector, and there will be kind of a constant noise uh, from all of these sources, and that will be a stochastic noise, yeah? Because they're coming from all directions. Uh, the good thing about these is that we, we understand very well the in-spiral phase, yeah? Which means we understand, we, we understand fairly well what the frequency shape uh, of, of this stochastic background is. Uh, and we understand also roughly what the amplitude is because we simply now we've measured a couple, right? So we have an, a fairly broad, but we have an estimate of the rate of these events, right? And that would give you a background. Um, so LIGO disappeared. So this was LISA, right? Here's LIGO. And that would give you, well, LISA comes down a bit more. Okay, that would give you a background roughly like this. Yeah, where this, this grows as uh, frequency to the two-thirds. Um, 
It probably cuts through LIGO. So we'll probably see it with LIGO uh, fairly soon. Maybe the next run, maybe the next, the next run. And um, we'll definitely see it with Lisa. Um, and then, so kind of a goal for now would be even just to see this background, to understand it, to make sure we understand the detector, we understand how to measure stochastic background. And then, but the goal for Lisa, because at the moment like this, it doesn't make, us make sense to build a detector which is so sensitive if you have this noise uh, right in the middle of it, right? So the goal for Lisa would be really to be able to subtract this background uh, and to find, look for other sources which we don't know, which we're not so certain about, and which lie underneath this background. Yeah, so this is why the kind of the goal, the goal is essentially, the moment the goal is, okay, measure this guy and see what we can learn. Yeah? Can we, how well can we measure the slope? Uh, so the frequency dependence, how well can we measure the properties like, like non-Gaussianity, like polarization? Um, and if we're good at that, then we can subtract it and then we can look for, for subdominant backgrounds. Uh, no, because I think it goes, I think it doesn't, th so it's not for the current, for the current PTA, uh, for SKA, I'm not sure about SKA, um, but I mean at some point yes, right, because it, it goes, ah, okay, no, okay, so actually, actually the one from LIGO, so the one, the, the one from 30 solar mass black holes, it actually stops about here. Uh, because, so this point essentially corresponds to the formation time of your binary, right? Because before the binary, binary is formed, because here you have inspired, 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 and merger. Uh, so the guys that merge at LIGO were formed roughly here. Um, I mean, depending again on astrophysics and star formation models, but the, the plots that I've seen, they start here. So this would not be a problem for PTA. But then, I mean, LISA has sources, right? Uh, supermassive black holes. And they have essentially a similar shape because it's also just an in spiral, just moved over here. And I think the tail of that can, does cut into the PTA band. So I think the subtraction techniques that are being developed for LISA um, probably are being also in parallel developed for PTA, I would assume. Or if not, they will be applied in, in one direction. So the, the idea for the subtraction is, um, so they call this, they call this a, a popcorn noise. Um, because it's actually, because I mean, these are, it's not a perfect stochastic background, right? I mean, these are many, many events, but they're not exactly homogeneous, right? So you do expect it kind of going pop, pop, pop like that. Um, and so you kind of, you do the time stream and you really, you cut out from the time stream, you cut out uh, the parts where you have uh, these pops. But I mean, all, all of this is underneath the noise, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's not as easy as as it sounds, but they think they can get rid of this noise and, and look for stuff underneath this. Any more questions? Okay. So, let's very briefly talk about inflation. Um, okay, so I assume you've more or less or at least roughly heard about inflation, cosmic inflation at some point. Last time to shout. Okay. So, I mean, very roughly, right, the idea is we have a scalar potential, uh, we have a scalar field, and the scalar field is slowly rolling down the scalar potential. The large vacuum energy gives us the exponential expansion of the universe. And the teeny little fluctuations of the scalar field are essentially associated uh, with the temperature and isotropies in the CMB. Yeah, but we don't only have the fluctuations of the scalar field, we also have the fluctuations of the metric. Yeah? And they lead to signatures, like fluctuations of the metric are nothing else than gravitational waves. Right? And so these lead to signatures both in the CMB and also for direct gravitational wave detection. In this, yes. Okay. So this is this is a very very uh, lightning statement. Okay. So this field has some little quantum fluctuations. Okay. And essentially, what this means is that at different parts in the universe, you can imagine inflation ends slightly earlier or slightly later. 
right? Which means that that part of the universe gets slightly more or less expanded, which means the energy is more or less dense at that point. And these density perturbations carry through onto the CMB, so onto the last scattering surface of the, of the photons with the thermal plasma, right? And they then result in photons which are slightly warmer or slightly colder uh, reaching us. Okay, so these are kind of the, the little, little tiny anisotropies in the temperature of the cosmic microwave background uh, that we observe uh, with Planck um, or before that with, with WMAP. Right. Right, right. So the, 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 fact that the fact that we have a very, very simple model which accurately predicts the statistics of the CMB is an extremely powerful tool in cosmology, right? You, you, it, really, it really very severely limits your possibilities to, to mess with anything. Um, yeah, like they can be, it, it constrains the amount of, of extra particles, of extra radiation that you can have. Uh, the, the, we know exactly what the, what the yeah, we, we've measured essentially the different contributions to the energy budget at the universe at the time of the CMB, and then later, uh, or earlier at, at Big Bang nuclear synthesis, and they agree very well, right? So it's, it's this, this is really what makes cosmology um, a serious business and not, uh, not just hand-waving. So <coughs> schematically, um, what happens, okay? So the scalar field here, phi, <coughs> we decompose into a homoge homogeneous part and an inhomogeneous part. And we, and we do the exact same thing for the metric. So we have some background G mu nu, uh, and we have some delta G mu nu. And this is, of course, nothing else than our gravitational wave. And it's exactly the same notation that we've been using uh, earlier. And OK, the slight complication arises because, um, yeah. Uh, but I mean, OK, the slight complication arises because, again, you have to be careful about uh, gauge degrees of freedom, right? So it's, one has to be careful that, there's because there's also a scalar inside here, there's a scalar inside here, so one has to be careful to identify uh, the correct degrees of freedom. But luckily, we've already done all of that uh, in our first lecture when we thought about this. So we already know that. For now, I'm not going to be interested in the scalar perturbations. I'm just going to be interested in the metric perturbations, because we want to talk about gravitational waves. And we know that here we have two tensor degrees of freedom, which are exactly our h plus and our h cross. Okay, I'm going to be optimistic on my skills of explaining this in half an hour and on your skills on uh, being awake on a Friday morning. But I'd like to, I think, I think one can, at least I'd like to briefly give an overview of how from this picture um, one arrives at the really the prediction from inflation. Okay, I won't go through all the steps, but I just at least want to sketch to you how this computation works because I think it's really a beautiful computation. So the plan is... Um, First, expand action to second order. Then derive, so leave some space here because we will do it actually. Uh, derive equations of motion. quantize an initial conditions uh, compute the power spectrum <coughs> 
Um, OK, and then finally compute omega GW. OK, so the, act the action that we have is uh, the action which essentially contains just the einstein hilbert term, right? Because we're only dealing with gravity. Uh, we can forget about this, this inflaton field again. So if you expand the einstein hilbert term to second order, um, it's also one of these computations which get incredibly messy on the way, but then the result is nice and simple. So I'll just give you the final result. A scale factor here, an h prime ij squared minus dl h aj squared. Yeah, so it's just it's just the kinetic term of the gravitational wave. Okay, so once once you arrive there, you kind of see okay, um, maybe we could have guessed that. OK, now we need the equation of motion. So for the equation of motion, we're going to introduce a canonical variable. So we absorb <coughs> this factor and the scale factor into h. So the new variable is called v. Um, depends in general on lambda and on k. And it's just a over 2 m Planck h lambda k. Okay, lambda was the, the uh, plus or cross helicity, k is the momentum. Um, this is also often called the, the Mukhanov variable. And if you do Euler-Lagrange, you get the equation of motion from here and you get the so-called uh, Mukhanov equation. So second time derivative plus k squared minus a double prime over a v k lambda equals zero. And you should recognize this because this is very, very, I mean, this is essentially the exact same thing that we had before uh, when we looked at the wave equation of the gravitational wave, right? Because it's nothing else, right? We're just looking at a quanta uh, of a metric fluctuation in the expanding universe. And again, there's a difference between subhorizon and superhorizon. And again, this object, well, because it's the same object, it just freezes out on superhorizon scales and it oscillates on subhorizon scales. And the nice thing now for inflation is because, because we have this exponential expansion of the universe, right, driven, driven by this vacuum energy here, what happens with superhorizon and subhorizon is that the modes, they start out on small scales they get stretched outside the horizon and then they re-enter into the horizon later, right? So we initially start in a regime where this dominates. We can compute the power spectrum in this regime, yeah? Then we go to the regime where this dominates, but then nothing happens, right? So all we need to do is we need to compute the power spectrum at the time of horizon crossing. And after horizon crossing, when the mode is outside the horizon, nothing happens. And then we will essentially go back to our other equation and take whatever enters inside the horizon as a kind of a source term. Okay, so that's kind of the two uh, steps of the computation. Yeah? You compute what happens from inflation uh, until the time of horizon crossing, then you stop, nothing happens for forever, and then you use whatever is your kind of, whatever enters the horizon at some given later time, you just use that as an input for your computation for omega GW. Okay, so now we need to quantize. Uh, so we just promote, um, okay, we promote our VK lambda to VK lambda hat uh, with creation and commutation operators. So yeah, these all, in principle, these all have lambdas. Uh, these have the, the usual uh, canonical c commutation relation. Okay, so we have, I think I was a little bit optimistic on my 
space here. So a a dagger is uh, for normalization, and then delta k minus k prime, delta lambda lambda prime. Okay, where okay, this guy comes with k and lambda. This guy comes with k prime and lambda prime. Um, and now, in order to quantize the system, we observe that when we go to the infinite past, right, uh, this term here disappears, and we're just left with a free wave equation. Uh, but that is a well-defined vacuum state, right? It's just a harmonic oscillator. So the only thing we know how to quantize is a harmonic oscillator. So good thing we found one. Um, and that tells us, so you go to, uh, yeah, tau goes to minus infinity, so the infinite past. Uh, you get a harmonic oscillator, and that tells you that in this limit, vk goes to 1 over 2k e to the minus i k tau. Okay, standard Bunch-Davis vacuum for a harmonic oscillator. But now, uh, now what do you have? Now you have, uh, you have a differential equation, right? And you have an initial condition. So you know what to do, a differential equation with an initial condition where you can just solve it. And the solution that you get is vk of tau is e to the minus i k tau over a square root of 2k, 1 minus i over k tau. So now we compute uh, now what we want to compute, we want to compute the power spectrums. We want to compute the two-point function of h and h, right? So recall that uh, h lambda k uh, was just given by 2m Planck b k lambda over a. Okay, so it's, that was just our normalization factor. Um, so the thing that we actually want to compute is h k lambda h k prime lambda prime right remember i told you that this is the object which defines uh, the power spectrum this p lambda um so you can compute it right you just plug this inside here and then you need to com compute the two-point function of this object but the two-point function of this object uh you know i mean this object is just given by this expression here right so there was a hat here uh, where the Fourier, the, what, not the, the coefficients were given by this function. So you just plug everything together. Um, so you get a 2 pi to the 3 delta k minus k prime. This is what the creation annihilation operators are doing for you, um, which is good because we were getting these factors also before and in our definition of the power spectrum. Uh, then here from the normalization, we have 2 over m Planck squared. Uh, and then we have v over a squared. So then we just insert this expression here. Um, so we get h prime over 2k to the 3, 1 plus k prime tau prime. And now on super horizon scales, so th this is true for all k, right? But actually we're not interested in all k, right? Because we only need this expression at horizon crossing, right? Because, I mean, you can see, you can see it already here. So you can see, so super horizon scales means that this thing uh, goes to zero, okay? Because this is just k tau, tau during inflation tau is minus a uh, minus 1 over a h. Uh, so large super horizon scales just means this object going to zero, uh, which means the only k dependence that you have here is this 1 over k cubed factor, right, which is just a, just a geometrical factor. But the, um, 
the, the non-trivial k-dependence goes away, and that is just reflecting that your wave is freezing out. Okay? So essentially all we need to compute here is the limit uh, in which this goes to zero. Right? Because that give, tells us what the power spectrum from inflation looks like on superhorizon scales. Um, so on the way we do superhorizon um, is fun. All we, the way we do superhorizon is we just put an H star here. Uh, and the star, the star now means at horizon crossing. Right? So for any, for even any given mode, you will now please evaluate uh, this object here at the time when this mode crosses the horizon. And that will give you, that will give you a slight time dependence. Yeah, because during inflation, the Hubble rate is given by the scalar potential. The scalar potential is approximately constant, but not exactly constant. So, okay, so the Hubble rate will be approximately constant, but not exactly constant. So you will get a, a slight time dependence because for every K mode, uh, you have to evaluate this uh, at a slightly different H star. But, but that's only a very small effect. The leading order, this gives you a, a <coughs> constant spectrum up to this uh, k to the tree factor. So this object here is precisely uh, what we called pH of k, uh, the power spectrum of gravitational waves um, before. And then one last comment on this, and that is uh, that often people, because this, often people just define away this k star factor, okay? So often you see uh, a quantity called a quantity called delta t squared, okay, which is defined here, which is defined as uh, k to the three pi squared p h of k, okay, and that that just. Uh, gets rid of this factor here. So that, in our case, would now be 2 m Planck squared h star over 2 pi squared. Um, and this, this here, this, this quantity, h star over 2 pi, this is nothing else than what, what is kind of the, the, quantum, the quantum fluctuations of uh, a scalar field in the early universe. Yeah, this is, this, this is universal for essentially all scalar fields. And because we're dealing with a gravitational wave, uh, we essentially got this factor 2 over m Planck squared up front, right? 2 because there's 2 degrees of freedom, and m Planck because, well, that's the coupling strength uh, of, of the gravitational wave. And what you've probably seen is that CMB measurements, right? They contain a quantity called the tensor to scalar ratio, yeah, which is precisely this delta t squared here. Uh, divided by delta s squared, which is the corresponding amplitude for the scalars. And this delta s squared is something that we've measured. Right? And this delta t squared is something that there's only an upper bound on r, so we don't know the magnitude of that. We only have an upper bound on the magnitude of that, which means we only have an upper bound on the energy scale of inflation. Okay, that was a very, very dense computation of how to arrive at this magic formula. Are there questions? Okay, so true, this is what I did here, right? Yes. Um, well, you are not forced to do that, right? So you, you can carry along the full metric. Um, the reason that I do it here is because, so we, okay, we know from observation that inflation lasted uh, at least 60 e folds, right? Because that's what we need to explain why the universe is so hom homogeneous and isotropic. But we don't know how long it actually lasted, right? I mean, there's no reason why it would last exactly 60 e folds. Right, so it could also last 120 e folds, or a thousand, or a million e folds, and then you would have a flat metric throughout inflation. But I guess in the choice of your vacuum, you're really sort of extrapolating this back to. Uh, when I go to when when I do this, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, but but here. To get rid of the ambiguity of choosing the vacuum in curved space. Right. Correct. Correct. But but I think this is um, okay. 
So the, qu the question is essentially, is there modification, is there modification to, to this equation uh, if you have a full curve sp space time in, in the limit, but you still have to go to the small tau limit, right? Because you still have to, you have to go to the limit where this, you send this to zero. Uh, and the question is, is there modifi modification to the free harmonic oscillator, right? Um, I don't know the precise answer to that, but I know an excellent textbook, which is Mukhanov's textbook, uh, who spends uh, essentially 200 pages discussing this question. And like how, how Yeah, I had a look at that. I wasn't satisfied. <laughs> yes, OK. <laughs> I don't think I can tell you anything which is not in this book. Um, because it's really about, yeah. I mean, but you, you're precisely right, right? We know, we know how to define the vacuum in, in flat space, right? But defining the vacuum in curved space time in general is a very difficult problem, right? I mean, which is why we kind of do this trick yeah. uh, and, and reduce it to flat space time. Because in curved space time, you have the problem that what you call a vacuum, you, you, because if, if what you call a vacuum changes over time, yeah, it, it gives you the possibility to produce particles out of nowhere, right? And that is a, a dangerous concept. Yeah. It's for the rotational waves, yeah. So here we're actually quantizing gravity. Here we're actually, for the first time in this lecture, uh, talking about quantized objects of, uh, of H lambda. And the reason, the reason for doing this um, is that it makes it very clear why, why you get these delta functions here, right? Because these delta functions are just a result uh, of, of the commutation relations. Yeah, but we haven't we haven't solved the cosmological constant problem, right? So if 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 you want, I mean, the, the idea is that here at, at the end of the day, right, you land in in the true vacuum at the end of inflation, right? And and here at the end, you will still be left with a with a CC. So it does not address. This is like a huge. It, it looks like the CC, but it's really it's a huge vacuum energy, uh, typically on top of what you would call the CC. So I think it just does not. It does not make the problem worse, but it does not make the problem better either. Yeah. Uh, does the theory explain why we start off with uh, any given value of phi? No, no. But but it doesn't matter because so what we observe, what we observe is the is the so. Is Okay, so what is well defined is the end of inflation. Okay, the end of inflation is essentially when the energy of the universe is no longer dominated by the potential energy, but also the kinetic energy starts to become important, right? So for a given scalar potential, which is your choice of theory, it is well defined when inflation ends. And then what we observe is essentially the, the CMB, that's our key observable. And that's what we call a 60 E folding, so 60 Hubble times back in time, right? So say we say the CMB is here, here is 60. So this is the observable range of inflation, right? Now it doesn't matter for all for all observations that we can possibly make. It doesn't matter if inflation started right here or if it started uh, way over here. Yeah. So it, it becomes a problem if you have a very tuned theory, right? So if your theory is is I don't know like this, right? Uh, then you would maybe have a tough time explaining how you ever got there in the first place. But uh, if your theory is a, is a reasonable theory. Um, then it's just random where you start. And as long as this, you have enough space, enough reasonable space to start, you, I mean, the, the, the expanding parts of the universe will, will take over the non-expanding parts. Okay, so let me compute the last step, which is um, omega, because that's our actual observable. So, so far, this computation is the exact same computation as you would do for the CMB, right? If you want to look for tens of fluctuations in the CMB, if you want to look for B modes in the CMB, so far, this is the exact same computation. But now we want omega. Um, right, so using, um, okay, so last step, uh, omega. 
Okay, so putting together which equation was it? Now it's gone. Well, okay. So essentially, essentially, this is just the um, okay. So what we want the just the equation we had earlier. So we want uh, the energy density today, right? Um, which we can just compute by you know, from this two-point function, we had this, the, the equation for the two-point function and taking the derivative of the two-point function, right, uh, to get omega. So we can do that here very concretely because it was just, uh, this was just a, a function. The only input in this equation was the transfer function, okay, uh, and this uh, power spectrum, right? So in our case, we now have the power spectrum, right? Because this power spectrum, so we compute it, I repeat, we compute it at horizon crossing, but then it is valid for the entire time when the gravitational wave is outside the horizon, right? And now we want to compute it today, yeah? So we can, this is essentially the primordial part that I was talking about. And now we need to redshift it, uh, taking out this one over a factor from the time of horizon entry until today. Yeah, so in this transfer function now it does not enter the production time, but it enters when it has come into the horizon. So, 1 over 32 pi g. There's a factor 2 because we have two polarizations. I'm now assuming both polarizations to be equal here, which is not always the case, but most of the time. D ln k, k cubed. Now we put plug in the power spectrum pi k m Planck squared. This is now the time of horizon crossing, uh, which of course I should put it in xk, yeah, because for every fluctuation it's a different time when the mode re-enters the horizon, times the scale factor today. And this was precisely what I was talking about, so we can compute omega in this way and it always is an integral over k and then the inside of this integral is what we call d l and omega over d l and k right and with that we can define the capital omega so the capital omega is nothing else than this object delta t squared divided by 12 k squared a scale factor today, Hubble rate today, and the transfer function, which is this object here, squared. Okay. So, first thing to see, it scales linearly with the tensor to scalar ratio. Okay. And that is an observable which we can get from the CME, but we haven't got it yet. Um, and then the entire scale dependence comes from the combination of the transfer function uh, and this k squared factor up here. And now the transfer function you get by computing this ratio. So it depends if the mode that you're looking at entered the universe during a, a, a phase which was radiation dominated or a phase which was matter dominated. Okay, so essentially in order to, to finally evaluate this object, all you need to do is you need to sit down with Kolb and Turner and you need to look at how the scale factor evolves during the different epochs of the universe um, and you can compute this ratio here. Okay, so I'm just going to give you the final result. So, uh, just yes. Times the arcade is now not the time of creation, but the time of re-entry. Exactly, precisely, precisely. And the resi final result for this object so is delta t squared over 12 uh, normalized to the radiation energy dens density in the universe today. Uh, then we have some degrees of freedom. G star, uh, so this is G star k means at the time when the, the, the effective number of degrees of freedom at the time when the mode k entered the horizon. Uh, 
i. Then today, um, yeah. And then, in principle, there's two different effective degrees of freedom, right? One is the one which appears in the formula for the energy density, and one which appears in the formula of the entropy density. Um, usually, they are more or less the same. But let's put them. And now it depends if your k entered uh, before, or if your k entered after matter radiation uh, equality, or if your k entered between matter radiation equality and the reheating. So this would be matter domination, this is radiation domination. Or if it enters above the reheating temperature, then it depends on the equation of state of the reheating phase, right? Which here I'm going to assume uh, that it's zero, okay? So that there's another matter dominated phase. And in that case, uh, this scales as one half k at matter, ra matter radiation equality over k, zero to k reheating over k, right? Where this is the mode uh, which entered the horizon precisely at matter radiation equality. Um, okay, and the interesting, the most interesting part, well, there's lots of interesting parts about this formula. Um, let's make a plot. Okay, so the first thing to observe, that for all modes that entered in the radiation-dominated regime, which is a lot of modes, this is about 15 orders of magnitude in K, this thing is constant. There's no K dependence, okay? So we have a scale invariant spectrum, and the only deviation from scale invariance comes because this guy, which was this guy, is not exactly scale invariant, right? So the only departure from scale invariant really comes from the change in the vacuum energy during inflation, which is small by construction, okay? So uh, to go to approximation, we here have a very big range of frequencies uh, where we have a constant spectrum. Um, I wish I had numbers on this plot now. Um, so I'm, these numbers might be wrong, right? Because I'm, I'm I don't have them on my plot, but I think this, this should be roughly maybe something like 10 to the minus 15 or so. Um, and this is, I mean, this, this, this depends on, so here we, have, uh, here we have matter radiation equality, here we would have reheating, okay? So this depends on the reheating temperature, um, but I mean, it could be something like 10 to the eight or so in Hertz. So this is a huge range of frequencies. And then uh, here and here, you have a scaling with one over F. Okay, so the, the picture looks like that. So, okay, this looks promising, right? Because you see these frequencies, um, LIGO, like, I mean, PTA is this frequency range, uh, LISA is here, LIGO is here. Um, so in principle, this looks very nice. I'd maybe to spoil at the end. Uh, also, another thing which is very nice is, um, so you have here this dependence on the number of degrees of freedom, right? Wh what that means is that if the number of degrees of freedom in your thermal bath changes, uh, there will be some feature in the spectrum, right? So for example, if when you go through the QCD phase transition, um, you know, you would get kind of a little, well, this is like in an idealized world, you would get a teeny little step here uh, corresponding to the QCD phase transition. If you have SUSY, uh, at, any, at any energy scale here, right, in principle you would see a feature in the spectrum uh, and could go looking for SUSY at that scale. That formula doesn't look like very continuous compared to what you're drawing. I mean... It should be continuous. Physics is always continuous. Yeah. Uh, what if you said K equal to... Uh, because of these factors of, of two and one half, right? Yeah. Yeah, let's just, um, okay, so th this, yeah, th okay, th this comes from, okay, this, okay, this comes from the precise way, the way these objects are defined here. Um, 
let's just let's just get rid of these factors, okay? Yeah, it's because okay, like the way I'm drawing it, doing it here, right? You would really think that you you have something uh, which has corners, right? And of course, it does not have corners. You know, there's nice transfer functions which tell you how to evolve from here to here. And I was essentially taking this into account in the left-hand part of the equation, but not in the right-hand part of the equation. So let's forget about that complication and just remove the factors of two, and then then it looks more sensible. Yes. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. So th these are the modes because, like, you have the end of inflation, right? And then you have some period of reheating, yeah. unt until you have actually. Uh, so, like, imagine now it's gone. Like, imagine you have your inflation potential here, right? Uh, so here you have inflation until some point, and then, like, the standard picture would be this field. Then now is dominated by kinetic energy, and it starts oscillating here. Yeah, and in that. While it's oscillating, it starts decaying into standard model particles. And at some point, they will have produced enough standard model particles that the energy density of the universe will be dominated by radiation. But this takes some time in general, right? So you have a phase after the end of inflation, but before you are radiation dominated, which is the actual reheating phase. And that takes, in general, a finite amount of time. Did you look at, uh, so you just assumed the uh, method of right. during Right, I assume matter domination during this oscillation phase, which, which gives me the slope. So this corresponds to omega equals zero. Uh, you can also have um, reheating phases where you are essentially radiation dominated immediately. So if you have, this will be essentially instant reheating, right? Uh, or you could have something which is a bit crazy, which is kination domination, so you're dominated by the kinetic energy. Uh, that would correspond to omega is minus one, and then it goes up. Um, so it depends. It depends on what's going on. So this last part depends on what's going on in the reheating phase. Also, the position of this kink depends on the reheating temperature, right? So if you could measure this kink, you could also measure what was the reheating temperature of the universe. Okay, but now comes the big spoiler, and the big spoiler is that <laughs> uh, LIGO is here, yeah. <laughs> Lisa is maybe here, uh, and PTA well, is here, right? So they are all, and, and this, this curve would correspond to a tensor to scalar ratio of 0.1. Okay, so that, that would be the most optimistic scenario, which would mean, okay, we haven't seen it in the CMB yet, but it's right around the corner, we're going to see it tomorrow, right? Uh, that would correspond to the theory prediction. We don't know what the 10 to the scalar ratio is, right? It could be 10 to the minus 2, it could be 10 to the minus 3, it could be 10 to the minus 10, for all that we know, right? So there is a free parameter which governs the amplitude, and it can be arbitrarily small, right? So we can be arbitrarily, uh, can be arbitrarily difficult to measure this thing. Um, and, but even in this most optimistic case, the current experiments are not going to see it. So I guess this is a log, log, log. So yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it's all significant. Um, I don't have the numbers here, but something uh, like off the top of my head, I would say something like three orders of magnitude or so. So like there's no way we're going to see it with the current experiments. But I'm not entirely sure about that number. I can look it up. Um, there is a proposal, which is Big Bang Observatory, um, which is I mean, it's not even, yeah, so, I mean, there's no funding, there's no collaboration. Um, it definitely nothing is ever going to happen before we don't fly LISA successfully and pro prove that this technology works. But there is a proposal for an instrument which supposedly uh, would reach down to a tensor to scalar ratio of 0.1. But if the tensor to scalar ratio is not a 0.1, um, then in this simple inflation models, uh, it's a beautiful signal, but it's, it's too low. There are things, so not all is hopeless, right? There are things that you can do um, to, well, depending on your point of view, you can either say, okay, you're making the model more complicated, or you can you say you're making the model more realistic. So you can consider couplings of the inflaton particle to standard model degrees of freedom, which you have to consider anyway, right? And some of them do nothing, and some of them do something. Yeah? So there's one, just want to mention very briefly, there's one particular coupling if you couple uh, the inflaton to the F mu nu dual of uh, an abelian group, 
So for example, the, the electromagnetic group, then you can dramatically change this picture, right? Then you can really have a signal which goes uh, all the way up here and, and could even, depending on the parameters again, uh, could be within uh, reach of LISA and LIGO. But I mean, these are more exotic models, right? In the, in the, um, in, in the simplest model of inflation, uh, it's a beautiful signal, but you can't see it. Um, there's one more comment I wanted to make, and that goes a bit back to the question of uh, the creation and annihilation operators, right? Because we computed this now uh, using creation and annihilation operators, um, but you can wonder if that is necessary, right? You can wonder if you cannot classically um, arrive at the same argument. And there's a very nice paper uh, by Wilczek and Krauss. So this is, um, this is about essentially the CMB, right? Um, so they, they look at, uh, the, their question is, can the, if, if we see B modes in the CMB, right? So if we detect gravitational waves in the CMB, um, does that tell us there was quantum gravity or could it also be classically somehow? Um, and they, all they do is they, they restore in this computation that we just did, they restore the factors of H bar. Um, and they come to the conclusion, with, with some caveats, they come to the conclusion uh, that it has to be actually a quantum effect. Um, so that's an interesting paper uh, to read if you need something to read on the, on the flight back home. Okay, uh, we're a bit over time. Any more questions? Yes? So in terms of the number of variables that we had in the theory, so one would be when inflation stops. Uh, so that would determine the critical density. And the other one would be the number of degrees of freedom. But it seems like the only observable that we have is the tensor to scalar ratio. So how can we fix these two parameters? Oh, well, we have, we have, unfortunately, we have more than two parameters. So the, the, the big problem is we have a, we don't know, we don't know what um, the scalar potential looks like, right? So here I've essentially assumed that this, I've used the approximation that the scalar potential is approximately constant, right? And then so it's, it's parameterized by one scale here. Uh, which is the uh, the Hubble rate, right? And then that's the parameter that enters into the into the amplitude. But in principle, I mean, um, so far we have measured we have measured the slope the, the the slope of this potential, the first and second derivative to some degree, only at one very small spot, right? Which corresponds to the CMB. Yeah. So essentially, all that we know about this potential is that okay, it has some properties here, and okay, it needs to do something so that we can actually end inflation. But what happens between here and here is totally up to your fantasy at the moment, right? So you can say, okay, uh, well, let's start with the simplest models. Uh, and as long as they're not excluded, they're probably the best ones. Um, but there's a lot, the, the, the freedom here is really that we don't know what the scalar potential looks like. And, but that's, that's I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because this is a huge power of, um, so if there's something which enhances the signal, right? This is an enormous power because with the CMB, no matter how good we are, right, um, we can always only probe this little part of the potential. Yeah, and the reason is that simply, if, in, if we detect gravitational waves through the CMB, the CMB is acting as, as our detector, and the CMB has a certain size. And we can't change the size of the CMB, right? So we can only measure gravitational waves that correspond to the size of the CMB. Here, in principle, you know, if we're ingenious enough, uh, we can measure the entire thing. Right? So we can measure, and that, and that corresponds to measuring the entire potential over the entire course of, of observable inflation. And then you would really know, then there would be no more freedom, right? Then you would really know what is the parametric form of the scalar potential. And the degrees of freedom, okay, yes. I mean, it depends on, I mean, f for first, I mean, this, this is not a very strong dependence, right? Because the G star S and the G star are usually pretty similar. So in the end, you have this to the power of one third. Right? So if you, if you and there's the, the standard model value is already 106. So if you add a few extra particles, it's not going to change anything. If you add 10,000 extra particles, it is going to change something, but not even so much, right? Because it's to the power of one third. Yeah. Could you comment on how this inflaton and standard model particle couplings could change this signal? So yeah, so the, the, reason, the reason is essentially um, that if you, add, if you add this equation, this, this term into your Lagrangian, 
um, and you look at the equation of motion for the gauge field, it gets a tachyonic instability. Yeah, and that means that essentially during inflation, you have an exponential production of gauge field quanta, and they form, and they, they have an energy momentum tensor, right? So these gauge field quanta act as a source in your gravitational wave equation. So you essentially have two sources of gravitational waves. One is, one is the standard vacuum quantum fluctuations, which is what we've computed here. And in this particular case, we have a second source, which is active during inflation, and which is very strong. So that's why this, this, that's why this particular coupling uh, would dramatically change the picture, uh, whereas most other couplings don't. Because normally you don't care about particle production during inflation because your universe is, is expanding, uh, so everything is diluted, right? But in this case, the production is also exponential, uh, so you do care. Yes. Yes. Which is fine. I mean, you're messing with that, but it's fine because you just adjust things such that it's... Right. Right, 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 right. So essentially, the, the CMB in this picture, the CMB lives, uh, lives here, right? Around matter radiation equality. Uh, so in principle, I have a lot of freedom to... Uh, to so I can, like, I can play with couplings like this, or I can play with the specific form of the potential, um, because things are only fixed at this, right? I mean, everything that we draw on this side is just based on the assumption that everything is as simple and as minimal uh, as it could be. Yes? Just a mi minor comment. So, um, so if you put 10,000 new particle species, you said, that's what you said, right? If you put yeah. Yeah, actually, in that case, the, the Planck scale comes down. So you cannot do it. Right. Well, I mean, you can do it, but then this, you corresponding, you have to lower the scale of inflation. Right, 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 the, right. Because the, the, fun, the fundamental Planck scale goes down as square, inverse square root of number of species. Right, right. So I think, right. So I mean, if. 10,000 10, would be too much. To, yeah. Too much to, for do, to do inflation around 10 to the 16 GB or something. Yes, yeah, right. Scale, right, right. So, right. And then the point I wanted to make is that I'm, I'm not. I'm not terribly worried about this factor because you would have to do something pretty radical to make this factor important. And if you do something pretty radical, uh, as Ajia is saying, you, you, you run into other problems. Oh. But, uh, sorry, just one point. But, but this is precisely related to um, what I was saying earlier, is that what we measure in the end is always a convolution of the primordial source and the evolution, right? So typically we have to make an assumption on, on one half and then we can say something about the other half. Yeah. I'm not following why we measure with the CMB the uh, potential when it's flat. So shouldn't we be at the bottom of the potential when the CMB happens? <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's true that the CMB happens when this is the actual decoupling of the photon, right? Um, happens, of course, when we're already far sitting down in this minimum. Yeah. But uh, the thing is that, uh, so let me draw a plot. <laughs> Uh, so here we have the Hubble scale uh, as a function of time, right? Say so scale factor. And um, so during inflation, the Hubble scale is constant, right? Uh, then we have, uh, let's forget about reheating. So we have uh, radiation domination and matter domination, okay? So we have vacuum, radiation, and matter. Uh, and now we have a, a co-moving fluctu uh, co fluctuation, right? So it's sourced. Is this going to work? Yeah. Ah, I always fail with this plot. Okay. So it should not. Okay, let's forget about matter, right? There's only, well, no, we need matter, damn it. Okay, so here. Here's matter, okay? So we have modes. Okay, entering at different times. So these are straight lines, okay? Despite that they don't look like straight lines. So a mode is sourced sub horizon during inflation, okay? Then uh, it exits the horizon, yeah, because the horizon during inflation is just constant. And then it re-enters at some later time. Okay? This particular mode uh, would now enter in radiation domination. Uh, this mode here would enter in matter domination. Uh, and this mode here enters at the border of radiation and matter domination, which is precisely when the CMB decoupled, right? So the CMB happened here, 
Okay. So what I'm saying is that the mode which entered the horizon at the time of the CMB, it exited the horizon at some time here, which was 60 E folds before the end of inflation. It was frozen from... Exactly. So to make the thing confusing, I can draw a time axis on this plot. Uh, and the time axis on this plot goes like this. This is time. Okay? Because here you have the modes uh, which were generated very early during inflation and which entered the horizon very late. And here you have the modes which exited very late towards the end of inflation, but then re-entered very shortly after.